Okay, concept three notes. We're going to talk about the muscular system. So we've already talked about the skeletal system and your joints. Now we're getting into your muscular system whose main function is movement. Muscles contract in order to produce movements. And like we said at the end of concept two, they're, they always pull, they never push. We also mentioned at the end of concept two, the insertion is where the muscle is attached to a movable bone, and then the origin is where the muscle is attached to an immovable bone. Whatever one muscle can do, there's always another that can undo it or do the reverse of it. Other functions though of the muscular system, because it's so much more than movement, are they maintain posture, they stabilize your joints, and they generate heat. So, ATP is needed for muscles to contract, which makes sense. Like there needs to be energy in order to do something like this. And we get ATP from breaking down carbohydrates like glucose during cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is overall an exothermic reaction. So therefore, muscle contractions give off heat as a byproduct of doing cellular respiration to provide the ATP for the contraction. And so they help maintain homeostasis and regulate constant body temperature, which is kind of interesting and something that's often overlooked, but super important. So as always, we're going to start with talking about how muscles can be classified. So we can classify them functionally into three groups. First are your prime movers or your agonists. These are muscles that are most responsible for producing a certain movement. So they're like the big player. So for instance, in a bicep curl, um, your biceps brachii are the muscle that like, that's like what's bulging when you curl. We can kind of see it right here, is the prime mover in forearm flexion. So remember we talked about in concept two, that flexion is, is bringing, um, is, is decreasing this angle in the joint. And so that's what we see here. So that's going to be the prime mover there. The other, another functional classification is the antagonist. So it's going to do the opposite. It's going to oppose or do the reverse of a certain movement. So usually stretched or relaxed when the prime mover is active. And um, these can also regulate prime movers by adding resistance. And they're typically located on the opposite side of a joint from the prime mover. So in a bicep curl, the triceps brachii are the antagonist in forearm flexion. So they're the ones that are going to antagonize this. Now, these can flip in forearm extension. So when we release a bicep curl, the triceps are the prime mover and the biceps become the antagonist. So that's something that's important to note. The third functional group are the synergists. These are your muscles that are helping the prime mover do whatever the main motion is we're trying to do. So they're either usually providing some sort of stabilization across the joint, or they might just be adding a little extra oomph to make the movement happen. Specifically, there's a certain type of synergist that's called a fixator. And these are the synergist muscles that are specifically immobilizing the muscle's origin bone to increase the prime mover's effects, effectiveness. So they're going to fixate that origin bone. And these are really important in helping to maintain our upright posture. So back to our bicep curl example, these two structures aren't pictured here, but you'll get to see them um, when you do your discovery stations of the muscular system. But the um, brachioradialis and the brachialis, which aren't pictured here, are synergists. So they're helping um, the biceps brachii with that forearm flexion. Um, the brachialis is under your biceps brachii, and it's usually contracting simultaneously with it. Um, and then your brachioradialis is in your forearm. Your rotator cuff muscles and your shoulder joints also are important in this. They act as fixators and add some stabilization there as you do this movement. So... This is where we'll pause in class and we'll learn about the different names of muscles and which ones are movers or prime movers and antagonists and all that. But for the sake of the video, we're going to keep moving on. So let's do a little review before we get into the structure of muscles, a little histology review from Unit 1, Intro to Anatomy. If you remember, there are three types of muscle tissue. There's your cardiac muscle tissue, which is striated. We can see that in our picture here. And it makes up your heart. 
Um, this type of tissue contract, con contracts involuntarily to pump blood throughout your body. Your smooth muscles are non-striated, as we can see, and they make up the walls of your visceral organs, and they also contract involuntarily to propel objects or substances down internal passageways. But the ones that we're going to really talk about in this concept specifically are your skeletal muscle tissues. These are striated muscles that are generally attached to bones, and they contract voluntarily to produce movement. And that voluntarily part is extremely important. This makes the connection between the muscular system and the nervous system really critical. So we'll talk a bit about the nervous system at the end of these notes. Fun fact is, I think this is fascinating, every muscle is considered its own organ. Remember, an organ is two or more types of tissue working together for a common function. So it's mainly made of muscle tissue, specifically skeletal muscle tissue, but there's also blood vessels and nerves and connective tissues too. So your skeletal muscles use so much energy that each one has their own nerve for signaling those voluntary contractions. They have their one artery and one or more veins that are going to serve its functions. So we obviously need the nerve for that um, stimulation of the muscle contraction since they don't contract voluntarily. And then we need the arteries and the veins um, to keep the muscle nourished with oxygen and then, of course, energy, which is so needed for muscle contractions. And we'll talk more about how the blood vessels contribute to this in our Unit 4 on transport. Um, but that's a little brief overview for now. So let's zoom in on skeletal muscles and talk about their structure more specifically because it's a pretty complex and very organized structure. First, we have your myofibrils. This is an organelle that makes up most of your muscle cells. That's one you probably haven't learned before. It is composed of thin filaments called myofilaments, which are either actin myofilaments, which mainly have a protein called actin in them, and or myosin, which are a thicker filament that have a protein called myosin in them. And these myofilaments run the length of each myofibril, as we can kind of see in the picture here. If we take a myofibril, so if we take this organelle and we kind of subdivide it lengthwise, those are called sarcomeres, and they are the contractile unit of the muscle, and they are very, very important, and we'll definitely be talking more about them. Now, myofibrils are these tiny thread-like organelles, and they get bunched together to form a muscle fiber, which is essentially the muscle cell. So muscle cells are muscle fibers. They are specialized specifically for contraction. So what do they need to do that? They need multiple mitochondria, which makes sense because they need to have access to lots of energy. They have nuclei. They have a specialized endoplasmic reticulum called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which we can kind of see on the outside here. They have cytoplasm, which is called sarcoplasm, and their cell membrane is called the sarcolemma. And then they have that organelle we just talked about, these myofibrils, which are critical for contraction. 80% um, of a muscle cell is these myofibrils. All the other organelles are squeezed around the myofibrils, and they're really large oval cells. They have a diameter anywhere from 10 to 100 micrometers, which that may mean nothing to you, but it's essentially up to 10 times larger than the average body cell. And they can be upwards of 30 centimeters long. A muscle cell could be that long. That's crazy. They have some other structures too, like glycosomes, um, which are granules of stored glycogen that help produce glucose um, when we need ATP. And they also have myoglobin, which is a red pigment um, for storing oxygen. But these are the main ones I want the people in my class to know. Now, muscle fibers bundle together to form fascicles. So each one, each fascicle is just a bundle of muscle cells, as you can see in the picture. And then these fascicles get bundled together to form the muscle organ. And your muscle organ is made of hundreds to thousands of muscle cells or muscle fibers, plus connective tissues, plus blood vessels, and plus nerve fibers. So we're going to talk a little bit about those connective tissues first. There's three different connective tissues that wrap around different parts of the muscle in order to support it. One's the epimesium. This is around the outside of the muscle. 
the paramecium wraps around each fascicle, and then the endomecium surrounds each muscle fiber. And these are so important for support and reinforcement and just really holding this muscle's complex structure together. They also keep your muscles from bulging, uh, or your bulging muscles from bursting, excuse me, in a really strong or intense um, muscle contraction. And then your epimesium and your paramecium, those first two I mentioned, those are dense, irregular connective tissues, and then the endomecium is a fine areolar connective tissue, if you remember talking about those in unit one. And your connective tissues are continuous with the tendons that are joining your muscles to your bones. And then they also serve as routes for your blood vessels and your nerve fibers that are going to innervate the muscles. So they're just super, super important. So important that in my class, we're actually going to stop here and we're just going to zoom in on this structure for a minute and make sure you really, really understand it by building a model of the muscle. But again, for the sake of the video, we're going to keep pushing through and talk about what is this muscle contraction that's going on that makes movement happen. Well, again, the sarcomeres are the key here. That's the contractile unit of the muscle. If we go back to our big picture diagram, it's, remember, the section of the myofibril. So each myofibril is just a chain of sarcomeres, and each sarcomere is separated by Z-discs or Z-lines they can be referred to, which are the borders on each end. So that's how you can tell what a, one sarcomere is. It's the between the Z-discs. This would just be a picture that's like a close-up of a myofibril. Um, the section from one Z-disc Z -disc to the next is a sarcomere. So the thick filaments are um, a myofilament that contain a contractile protein called myosin. That's like the purple ones. And then the thin filaments are a, um, a myofilament that contains a contractile protein, actin. So we're going to refer to them as actin and myosin, and they are so important. So, um, oh, also I should mention, the thin filaments that actin also contain an other important regulatory proteins called tropomyosin and troponin, um, but I'm not going to get into those until a little bit later for my advanced classes. And then there's also these I bands, A bands, and H zones, and I don't, it doesn't, I'm not going to have you label those at any point. I care more about what we're about to talk about next for my students. So that's this thing called the sliding filament model. So what's happening? When a contraction occurs, this is how a sarcomere changes. So look at these two pictures. Notice what's different. Okay, the z discs, for instance, are closer together. So the sarcomere is showing contraction. The H zone basically disappears as these actin pull together. And notice the myosin length doesn't really change at all. So here's what's going down. Muscles contract because sarcomeres contract when the myofilaments excuse me, are sliding past each other. The heads of the thick myosin filament grab on to the thin actin filaments and they pull the thin ones so that they slide past the thick ones and it yields more overlap of the actin and myosin filaments and thus a shortening of the sarcomere. So that's how the muscle contraction is happening. And this is occurring simultaneously in sarcomeres all throughout the cell, which is what leads to the whole muscle cell shortening and eventually we'll talk about the whole muscle itself. So what are the details? All right, my non-honor students, I'm not going to make you know these, but we're going to go through them for my advanced students and for just for the sake of understanding the complexity. So myosin, those thick filaments, want to touch actin, your thin filaments, so badly, but they can't do it without two things, energy from ATP and access. So remember I mentioned there's a regulatory protein called tribomyosin, it's blocking the actin, so the myosin can't get to it. So first, how does the myosin gain access? Well, your neurons signal an action potential in a muscle cell that's gonna trigger calcium channels in your sarcoplasmic reticulum to open and release calcium that's stored there. Calcium is gonna grab onto troponin, which is another regulatory protein I mentioned. The troponin just grabs onto the tropomyosin and pulls it out of the way, so now we have access. Now, we need the energy to actually do something about it though, and that comes from ATP. So myosin grabs an ATP, it rips a phosphate off. If you remember from biology one, if we remove that third phosphate, that's where the majority of the energy is stored. So energy gets released, 
And that's the energy that we need to bind the myosin to the actin, which is called a power stroke. And that's what creates the muscle contraction. In order for the muscle to relax, that ADP and the free phosphate that get ripped off, they unbind from the myosin and they allow fresh ATP to come and bind in. And that causes the myosin to release from the actin until the new ATP will then be broken down to release the energy needed to grab the actin again. And there's a great video we'll watch about this. Now remember, where does this ATP come from in the first place? Go back to the basics of biology one. It comes from breaking down carbohydrates like glucose during cellular respiration. And they get delivered to the muscle cells via the blood that's in the artery that is nourishing the muscle. So that's really, really important. And so that's why your muscle cells need lots of mitochondria. And they need the blood vessels constantly supplying um, sugar so that they can be broken down to get the ATP. When calcium unbinds from the troponin, the actin gets blocked again by the tropomyosin, and it all has to be repeated again, the whole process. Here's kind of a visual version of it, and I have a great animation I'll show you in class, but the contraction cycle begins when ATP energizes the myosin head, and it's converted to ADP in a phosphate because that gets ripped off, and that's what provides the energy. Um, calcium ions bond to the troponin and remove the blocking action of the tropomyosin, which is going to expose the active site, which is where the myosin will then be able to bind to the actin, create something called a cross bridge, which is basically just where they touch. The myosin head, it pivots um, by using the energy from the ATP, which is the pulling motion, which causes the sliding. As a new ATP comes in, it'll detach and the cross bridge is no longer there. And then, um, it's released and it kind of recocks then to reattach. So there's another kind of visual version of it. So we cannot talk about the mu a muscle contraction without talking about the nervous system because skeletal muscles only contract voluntarily. So they can't just contract unless something stimulates them. And we haven't covered the nervous system in my class yet. So this is going to be a brief overview. It'll make more sense once we do unit three and we talk about it. Um, but again, contractions are only happening if they're activated or stimulated by the nervous system. And the nervous system does that by using somatic motor neurons to connect with skeletal muscles and signal for them to contract. And this is important. Neurons and muscle cells are excitable cells, meaning we can get them to respond to external stimuli by changing something called their resting membrane potential, and that's going to yield a signal that's going to cause things to happen. So resting membrane potential is the voltage across the cell membrane. It's usually between negative 50 to negative 90, um, which is what we can see right here in this picture. This would be the resting membrane potential. And an action potential is a large change in the membrane potential that's going to spread rapidly over long distances within the cell. So essentially, it's going to be a movement of ions through ion channels that are going to create this large change. So they're going to cause a depolarization and then a repolarization. And then there's kind of this refractory period where it recovers and gets back to its resting membrane potential. So this is what it would look like in a simple graph. This is more what's happening. Um, the sodium potassium pump that we mentioned in unit one is so critical for this. But you can kind of see you have your resting potential. Your action potential is... Um, begins when there's a depolarization. So we're pumping and, and creating an imbalance here. And then um, we kind of get back to normal here with the sodium potassium pump being utilized. So the somatic neur motor neurons that activate the skeletal muscle fibers for contraction, they're mainly located in your spinal cord. Their neuron cell body, which is what's pictured here in the spinal cord, has this extension called an axon. That's this whole part that connects to the muscle fiber that it's signaling, wherever that may be. And it forms a neuromuscular junction, also known as a motor end plate. That's right here. It's where the axon terminals, the end of the axon, meet the muscle fiber. And it also has this space that's between them, which is called a synaptic cleft, which I'll show you on the next page. With the exception... Um, the muscles in your head and neck um, are not in the spinal cord, the somatic motor neurons, but everywhere else they are. And every muscle has one nerve, which can have a ton of axons, 
which can signal a, or have hundreds of motor neurons um, that then they're going to signal all these different skeletal muscles. So, um, oh, another name for neuromuscular junction, because why not have three for the same thing, are myoneural junctions. So just so you're familiar with that. All right, let's look at a um, neuromuscular junction in the synaptic cleft a little bit closer. So this would be like zooming in right here. So look at this on this picture. This is what we're seeing like right here if we zoom in, which you can also see here. So zooming in on that connection point, action potentials don't move from cell to cell. So they have to be converted to neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers that can di then diffuse through this synaptic cleft, which is this gap between your somatic motor neuron and your skeletal muscle cell and to, in order to spread the signal. So that's what's happening here is the, these neurotransmitters are going to go through and then get into here and then do the signaling that they need to do. Acetylcholine, ACH, is the neurotransmitter motor neurons use in muscle contraction, and that's really important. So that's what's traveling through this synaptic cleft in order to send the signal to cause stimulation. So essentially, details what's going down. A motor neuron fires an action potential. So here's our motor neuron. It's going to fire this action potential down its axon. The motor neuron's axon terminal, which we can see zoomed in right here, so we're looking at this zoomed in, is going to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine binds to receptors on the muscle fiber cell. Cell membrane, remember the cell membrane of the muscle fiber is called the sarcolemma. So it's going to bind to those receptors there, and this causes a local depolarization, which is going to yield the muscle fiber to be excited, which is going to yield an action potential um, in whatever sarcolemma are adjacent to it. And then that signal causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release that calcium, which is really important, we said, to provide access for the myosin to the actin because the calcium binds the troponin, which moves the tropomyosin out of the way, and the contraction can happen. So this is all what's going down on a completely detailed perspective. And there's a bunch of other words that are important to know, too. I'm not just going to lecture through a bunch of vocab for you. You're going to read these and learn these um, for yourself that we can keep doing talking big picture stuff. So let's get out of the details. Let's talk big picture. How can muscles increase their force of their contraction? Well, there's a couple ways, but here are three. One is they can increase the frequency of their motor neuron stimulation. And the more frequently they're stimulating the motor neurons, thus they're stimulating the whole motor unit and thus the whole muscle contraction. The sarcomeres are not gonna be able to relax if they stay contracted. So. Um, that's what this frequent stimulation is going to do. We can also increase the number of motor units and thus the number of muscle fibers that are being stimulated. And then we can also increase the size of the muscle fibers. The bulkier the muscle, which results from more regular resistance exercises and resistance training, the more tension that can then build up in the muscle fiber and um, create, allow it to endure more force applied to it. And there's some pretty cool physics connections to what's going on in your muscles and in your joints in your body that I wanted to mention in our last few slides. Your muscles act with bones to just basically form lever systems. Our bones are like the levers and our joints are like the fulcrum. So the lever is what's in black in these pictures and the fulcrums are the joints which are in blue. A lever is just a rigid bar that moves on a fixed point, which is the fulcrum, when a force is applied to it. An effort is that applied force, and it's used to move some sort of resistance or load. A muscle contraction creates the effort that is applied to the insertion bone, which is the load. And if the effort is further from the fulcrum than the load is, then there is a mechanical advantage, like we would see in this picture. If the effort is nearer to the fulcrum than the load is, then it kind of creates something called a mechanical disadvantage, which can actually be a good thing, too. So there's three types of levers, and I'll give you an example of each in the body, and then we'll be done. I know this has gotten a little long. First class lever. If the effort is applied at one end of the lever and the load is at the other with the fulcrum in between. So load on one end, applied force or effort on one end, um, and then we've got the fulcrum. It's like a seesaw or scissors, how they work. And this is how it works in the lever that's in your that raises your head from your chest when your chin's down. Another type is the effort um, or the applied force is applied at one end of the lever and the fulcrum is at the other, and then the load would be in between. This is like how a wheelbarrow works. 
And an example is like when what allows you to stand on your toes. That's exactly how it's going there. And then lastly, the third class lever is the effort is applied between the load and the fulcrum. So this is like how twe tweezers or forceps work. And that's how the lever system in your bicep curl works as well. And I think these diagrams are super helpful. The words don't make as much sense to me as the diagrams do, so I hope they help you too. And that is the muscular system.